Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first DFAT acted, uh, webinar for 2018. Apologies for the delay, it looks like we had a bit of a system issue with that trouble troubleshooting that one successfully. I just want to check in in the first and see if you could hear me. And let's see. Okay, so it looks like the mic is just breaking up a little bit, so I'm just going to hold to that. Is that a little bit better now? Are you finding the, uh, the, the, the volume a little bit better? Hopefully you are and that you can hear me. If not, uh, adjust your settings at your end, still breaking up a little bit. Here we go. All right, hopefully that. All right, hopefully that's okay now, guys. Um, what I will do is kick off um, and hand over to, to Marty from Diva, who's here for us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to keep capturing at my end, but I would also um, recommend that you check it everything that you're okay at your end as well. So without further ado, here is Marty from DFAT. Marty. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to so many of you for joining us today for the RDE webinar. And thank you so much to ACFED. Thank you, Elizabeth, for hosting us and hosting the entire series of webinars for the ANCP over 2018. It's wonderful to be able to reach you all directly in this um, way, though of course we are looking forward to those times when we catch up face to face with ANCP accredited NGOs throughout the year. So today with me in the room, I have a couple of colleagues. The first is Rosemary Welsh. She's recently joined the ANCP team at DFAT, um, from within DFAT and joining us in the operations team and will be overseeing the RDO process. And also with me is Jeff Simkus from PK Consolidated. Some of you may um, be familiar with Jeff if he's undertaken the financial assessment for your accreditation in recent years. And DFAT has engaged Jeff to do the RDE reviews this financial year. So after you all make your RDE submissions um, for ANCP, Jeff will make those assessments and make sure that everything's in shape before we calculate grant amounts. I don't know if you guys want to say hello. Welcome, hello. everyone. Yep. So let's get straight into it um, with the presentation. So today we're going to go through um, RDE. We're going to go through the type of information that's in the RDE explanatory notes, which I really hope many of you have had a chance to read. And just make sure that you understand uh, the definitions and the information that's provided in the RDE explanatory notes and that you also understand how to translate that information into the RDE worksheet and be able to correctly fill out the worksheet and make your submission. We're going to talk a little bit about common errors that NGOs have had in recent years, things to be aware of, and um, point you in the right direction where to get more information during the RDE submission process. And also this year we want to just talk through the process and, and the rationale behind RDE spot checks so you can better understand why DFAT undertakes those throughout the year. Just to let you all know um, online that we have a number of NGOs that are participating in the webinar today. Some of them are accredited, some of you are accredited NGOs and you'll be making your RDE submission on the 31st of March to DFAT. Other NGOs are not accredited um, NGOs at the moment. So you might be um, looking to make an accreditation application now, uh, in the near future or in the distant future. So I'm going to pitch the um, this webinar, or we're going to pitch the information so that it um, suits all of those NGOs that are online. So we're going to sort of start at that um, very beginning starting point for you. We hope we're going to keep this informal today. So as we go through these different um, sections of the webinar, Please feel free to type in your questions as we go along and we'll try and answer them there at the relevant point in the presentation that we're making. Of course, there'll be time for questions at the end though. If you get to the end of the presentation and you haven't found the right spot to answer, ask your question yet, then of course there'll be time at the end. Okay, let's get stuck into it. <clears throat> so I guess there's a little bit of a background. You, As I mentioned, you hopefully all had a look at the RDE explanatory, note, explanatory notes. Those uh, explanatory notes were updated around about this time last year 
and we haven't changed them this year. So they are the same as last year. There haven't been any changes to the explanatory notes or the RDE submission forms since last year. But we did want to sort of remind you uh, of the principle and the definition of RDE. So, you know, here it is on the screen in front of you, but there are a few key points to this and it makes sense why we have different sections of this presentation and different sections of the submission form in relation to this definition. So the first is that your RDE is your annual eligible expenditure. So not revenue or not income or not funds or anything like that. It's that annual eligible expenditure of an NGO using contributions from the Australian community. So not using contributions from the Australian government or foreign donors, it's contributions from the Australian community that you have actually spent in the previous, in your previous financial period. Um, then eligible items are your own development projects, emergency relief, rehabilitation, um, and development education in Australia. That is to say all other things are not eligible. <clears throat> and then the principle, of course, being that eligible contributions can include cash and in-kind and volunteer services, but your uh, amount of in-kind and volunteer services can't exceed your cash to be eligible for DFAT RDE purposes. So why does DFAT uh, collect RDE? from each accredited NGO each year? Well, there's two reasons. One is to make sure that you still remain eligible for accreditation in the ANCP and <clears throat> or that you're eligible to apply for accreditation to the ANCP. You'll recall that to be eligible for base accreditation, you need an RDE averaged over the previous three years of $50,000. And to be eligible for full accreditation, you need an RDE of $100,000 averaged over the pre three previous years. We also use RDE, or a three-year average of RDE, to calculate the ANCP grant that each full-level NGO will receive. So the full details of the ANCP funding policy can be found in the ANCP manual. That's published on the DFAT website once you go to www.dfat.gov.au, if you type ANCP manual into the search bar, you'll find the ANCP manual published there and it has full details of our funding policy. But as a quick recap, you'll remember that full level accredited NGOs receive $300,000 plus a proportion of the remaining funds to measure it with their RDE. So something an RDE submission does not do is it does not help us assess the financial viability of your organisation and it doesn't provide us any sort of indication of the effectiveness of an NGO. So it's purely a financial figure on funds raised from the Australian community and expended on legitimate development activities in the previous year, development and humanitarian activities in the previous years. <clears throat> So that you'll see throughout the RDE explanatory notes, which I know you've all read and memorised, that um, there's a lot of links, um, a lot of uh, reference to your audited financial statements and the RDE submission that you need to make. So the reason why uh, DFAT asks that your RDE submissions are linked to your audited financial statements is that that way we have confidence that they've been checked and signed off as as by an independent and appropriately qualified auditor who has had a look at your financial accounts. That way we have confidence that it accurately reflects your organisation's true financial situation and your compliance with the ACFID Code of Conduct in the way that those audited financial statements are pre presented consistently with the code, the code guide. It also provides greater transparency and consistency and given that RDE is used to calculate the grant amounts for each organisation and used to determine whether or not you're eligible for accreditation, we need to have the highest levels of transparency for RDE. <clears throat> so when you make any adjustments between the figures that are in your audited financial statements and the RDE worksheet, 
we really do ask that you can provide that evidence that's going to be easily understood by Jeff as he goes through and does the assessment of your RDE submission. So that when he's looking at your AFS and he's looking at your RDE worksheet, if you've made an adjustment, he can see how you've made that adjustment and hopefully why you've made that adjustment. That'll save Jeff having to come back to you and ask a lot of questions and get you to, to uh, modify things in, the, in, in finalising your submission. Yeah. As we go through the form today, which we're going to do in, um, in a few slides, um, a few slides on, you'll see that there's a spot in the form where you can upload an Excel spreadsheet where you've done where you've done those adjustments or where you can provide evidence for how you've made that adjustment. I'll show you where that is in a few minutes. So here's the RDE calculation method. I know everyone likes a little bit of maths on a Tuesday afternoon. But really, it's it's quite a straight um, forward formula. In that first, you enter your eligible disbursements in the form. Then you enter all of your deductions. And the system will take your eligible dis disbursements and subtract your deductions. So that'll give you your total cash RDE, shown as C here on the screen. You then enter in your non-cash RDE, which is the total value of your gifts in kind and volunteer services. And then you add your total cash RDE and you add your total non-cash RDE as long as it's no greater than your total cash and that will give you the total RDE. Hopefully this will all make sense to you as we start to go through the form and you see how it works. So RDE submissions <clears throat> for all accredited NGOs, the third milestone in your ANCP grant agreement. So the third requirement is that you submit your RDE submissions by 5pm on the 31st of March. This year, the 31st of March does fall on a Saturday and it happens to be Easter Saturday. So that the Friday before will be Good Friday. So please remember that really for many of you, this means you're going to want to have your RDE submission in by the time you go home on Thursday before Easter, the 29th of March. Remember on Friday the 30th of March, on Good Friday, and also on Saturday the 31st of March, there won't be anyone uh, available at DFAT should you have any technical difficulties in submitting your form. So we do really suggest to all of you that you try and submit it by that Thursday before Easter. Um, of course, we do consider changing dates, but the 31st of March has been the submission date for many, many years. And for everybody's sanity, we like to leave our key milestone dates the same, regardless of which day of the week they fall on. So while the window will be open until 5 o'clock on the Saturday, we will try and get it in on that Thursday. Extensions are unfortunately just not possible for RDE submissions. Once you provide your submission to us, Jeff then has just one month to be able to go through all 57 of your submissions, comparing those to your audited financial statements and looking at your adjustments and having conversations with many of you in order to be able to finalise and lock in your RDE amounts before the budget is handed down on the, uh, in the first week of May. So it only provides Jeff with a short window to be able to do those 57 assessments. So. Everyone's in this together and if everybody would like to get their grant amount advised to them soon after the budget is handed down, which I'm sure you all do, then we do ask that you please don't ask for an extension on RDE submissions. Um, you make your RDE submission via the link that's on the page using Smarty Grants or ANCP Online. <coughs> the, those of you who are keen-eyed will of course notice that I've got a mistake in my slide and in fact the URL should be RDE 2018 at the end, not 2017. My apologies for that. But we have sent in the most recent ANCP bulletin that we sent out on the 6th of February to all ANCP contacts 1 and 2 within all the accredited NGOs, we have sent this URL that you should be able to follow directly from that email. We'll also send a reminder out in a couple of weeks and include the URL in there. Early submissions are very welcome. And there's already one NGO that has submitted. Thank you very much. So please do feel free to submit any time between now and the 29th of March. 
The ANCP team will be tr uh, following along the submissions to see who's submitted or who hasn't submitted. And if it comes to a few days before Thursday the 29th of March and we notice that your organisation hasn't even opened up a form as yet, we will give you a call and a reminder just to make sure that you're on top of your submission. So if you get a call for us, from us, it's just because we want to make sure you haven't forgotten not because you're in trouble. So that's kind of the rationale and a bit of the reason behind the RDE submissions. What I'm going to go do now is go through the actual submission form. I've got screenshots of all of the different parts of the form and we're going to go through it bit by bit and I'll give you any hints on what you need to do in Smarty Grants to actually make the form work for you. But we'll also talk about which information, which de details and data you should record at each point in the form. So first up, when you go, when you follow that um, link to the 2018 RDE submission, the first screen you'll come to is this log on or register screen. If you, if your organisation has um, completed an RDE submission before, you should be able to just go to that login section and use the email address and password that you previously have, and then create a 2018 form. Those NGOs that are doing an RDE, or completing an RDE submission for the first ever time or using um, ANCP online for the first ever time, you can use the register side of the, um, of the homepage there that's highlighted in yellow and create a new user account. Please we do ask, and I'm, definitely this is something that occurs every year that causes us dramas, but when you type in your name and your organisation here, please use your NGO name both times in both of these boxes. It is a system limitation that we can't change this front registration page. But if you enter your name, such as Bob Smith, and then put your organisation's name underneath, forevermore all your RDE submission forms will be called Bob Smith instead of being named after your organisation. So please enter your NGO's name both under the Your Name section and the Organisation section. So let's get into the actual um, financial areas. <coughs> so first up at the top, again straightforward, you, there'll be a drop down box and you just select the name of your NGO. The reason there's the other box underneath that is that if your organisation has one legal entity name and then another trading name that you would like to include underneath, you can put your trading name in that other box. We then ask you to enter the financial year end that's relevant to your NGO. So you can pop here the last day of your most recent financial year that your RDE submission is going to relate to. And finally, in the drop down box, you can choose your accreditation type, whether you're base or full. So that should hopefully be pretty straightforward. As we move on to the first section, this is where you're going to enter your eligible disbursements. So the eligible expenditure that you have. There's just three sections to complete here. So the first is funds to international programs. This should be funds to international programs um, drawn directly as they're listed in your audited financial statements. Um, just, and then underneath, you've got program support costs that also should come from your audited financial statements and the same for community education. Disbursements on Australian community education are eligible to be included in RDE subject to meeting the requirements of the definition in the Acford Code of Conduct. So make sure you're familiar with each of those. Uh, eligible community education costs includes the costs of producing and distributing materials and conducting educational meetings. And these costs are often included in marketing or fundraising costs of many NGOs. But unless they're segregated out in your audited financial statements, you cannot list them in your RDE and you would therefore be missing out on the opportunity to maximise your RDE if you don't separate those community education costs out in your AFS. Um, organisations, if you're going to uh, look at 
at claiming these education costs, you have to have the appropriate systems and processes in place to capture or estimate the costs of community education expenditure. Sure. And it should be shown separately as a line item in your AFS in line with the ACFID requirements. The explanatory notes provide an example as, uh, on this as to how you might proportionately calculate the value of uh, community education materials that may, for example, include some fundraising material at the end of it. So do have a look at the, um, the ACFID guide and also the RDE explanatory notes to check some definitions there. I don't know if anyone has any questions on eligibility at this point for those, for those categories, please feel free to ask us. But in the meantime, what the Smarty Grants, sorry, what the ANCP form is going to do for you here at this point is once you've entered the figures into 1A, 1B and 2, uh, it will automatically tally those up at line number three and give you the total eligible disbursements. Okay, so if there's no questions there, we'll move on to the next section. And this is the section about deductions. So here at section four, um, remember that the, within the principle of the, RDE of the RDE principle, it's in the RDE explanatory notes, RDE is the annual eligible expenditure of each NGO using contributions from the Australian community. So here at point four, we're looking to separate out those um, items of expenditure that have not used funds from the Australian community. So in the first instance, um, at line 4A, you should exclude all DFAT funding that your organisation has received um, and used for domestic programs or administration costs. So Australian Commonwealth or state government departments or agencies all um, constitute um, yeah, constitute Australian government funding. So at 4B, um, at 4B, you're wanting to include all other Australian government departments and or accredited NGOs that have provided funding. <clears throat> um, I've got a question from Anna about do, do I put in the numbers rounded to the thousands or as per the audited financials or the full amount to the dollar, please? We ask that you put it to the full amount to the yeah. dollar, please. Um, if you're rounding, you're probably going to be either cutting yourself short or overselling yourself. So please put it to the exact dollar. Either cutting yourself short or overselling yourself. So please put it to the exact dollar um, across the board. So sorry, as we're talking about 4B, so here you're going to um, exclude any or include including the data in this field at 4B, any funds that you um, spent that had an original source being from another Australian government department, a state government department, or an Australian institution where their original funding source was from the government, and also from another accredited NGO if you received funds from them. In these instances, that other NGO would have already um, included this in their own RDA. So also any, um, um, I have forgotten Jeff, but at 4A, sorry to mm. confuse you all and jump that, at point 4A, when you're including DFAT um, expended funds, you should also include any interest that you have earned and spent that has been earned and spent from DFAT funds. I've got another question here that are grants from non-government Australian organisations classed as a deduction. No, they're not unless that non-government Australian organisation received those funds from the Australian government in the first instance. So as long as those grants are purely private or corporate donations, they do not need to be deducted at this point. Um, <coughs> which I guess leads me on to the other point is that Grants or contracts and associated interest that you earn from any Australian corporate or philanthropic organisation, foundation, for example, are eligible for RDE purposes. 
come ad plan time, many of you ask me or ask the operations team at um, the ANCP if those funds can be counted as NGO matched funding in your ad plan. And they can be, the answer is yes. But if those funds have been um, tagged for a specific project, so for example, if a large bank has specifically said this money is for your economic development project in Fiji, then when you um, list other donors for that project in that ad plan, we ask that you would put name of big bank and the amount that they have given you. You can still claim in the RBE, you can still claim them as your NGO co-contribution, but we do ask that you let us know that that big donor has specifically earmarked funds for a specific project. I'll go on now, if there's no more questions about those um, deductions from non-Australian sources, then I'll move on to other ineligible disbursements. And these are really the, um, the, those parts of your expenditure that don't relate to eligible activities, so not for development or humanitarian activities. So the RDA explanatory notes do have definitions for all of these um, items that are listed here under five. So first being for welfare, religious and political activities. So political activities um, really refer to those partisan political activities or those where you might be supporting a separatist movement, something like that. Definition in the ANCP manual. Second, um, is religious activities. Previously, these have been referred to as um, evangelical activities, but the terminology is consistent with the Act of Code of Conduct for religious activities. And it also includes any um, build up of religious structures, whether it be assets or training or organisational activities that help only to build a religious side of an organisation. Um, and then, of course, welfare has uh, always been included in ineligible activities and DFAT really defines welfare as those activities which are designed to maintain beneficiaries in a certain state and where it doesn't lead to that sort of long-term development and there's no clear, sustainable um, outcome for those communities maintained in the, or those beneficiaries maintained in the same state on an ongoing basis. So at 5B, both 1 and 2, being channeled funds and uh, payments to international partners, alliances or affiliates, these are to be deducted here. As these are those um, items of expenditure where your organisation does not have direct control of how those funds are spent. So the principle being that RDE eligible items are for those development activities that your organisation undertakes, so not activities that someone else undertakes with funds that you happen to have sent to them. Finally, at 5C, there's um, administration or promotion costs for international or regional affiliates. So here you should be including the total amount that you may have sent to international or regional affiliates for administration, fundraising, or general promotion of the organisation. This includes administration for overseas country offices, which you'll need to list here as a deduction following you most likely having included it at item 1A in your eligible disbursements. As a rule of thumb, if you're in doubt as to whether or not the activity or the item that you have is eligible, either um, contact the DFAT team and ask us and we can help you out or err on the side of caution and leave it out in the first instance. Jeff, I don't know if you had any other comments about eligible and ineligible expenditure that you wanted to pop in at this point. Thanks, Marty. I think you've probably covered most of it, but it is also, it's always important just to make sure uh, that you check um, before you deduct something that it was actually, has been included in the um, 
line items in either 1A, B or C. So essentially if you're deducting administration costs for a country office then you make sure that was part of funds that you'd actually previously sent to international programs and was included under under 1A. So you just do that uh, do that double check. Um, and so that deduction at 5C being the administration costs or promotional costs of uh, affiliates. The promotional cost of affiliates is probably not as relevant now because marketing and administration costs are excluded. But um, any admin costs um, you would actually uh, exclude under your definitions in the uh, ANCP uh, manual under 10.1 uh, administration costs. There is a question that's just come in. So Leanne's asking, um, we have a staff member overseas who oversees some of our projects. Can these costs be included? Um, <coughs> so project, project manager salary costs, for example, are, I would say, a legitimate um, cost of uh, um, managing your program, international yeah. program. So yeah. I think this is fair enough to include this um, both, you know, in terms of your ad plan as a project cost, um, but also in terms of your funds to international programs, I would say that those, or, you know, the relevant proportion of those costs could be included. Yeah, so if it's either, if it's not directly coded to a specific project and included under 1A is uh, funds to international projects, and you expect that it, it would be relevant to be deducted under 1B or program support costs, particularly if you're a manager. But if you are, if they are managing a uh, large number of projects overseas, then would it certainly encourage you to include that as part of the budget for uh, those specific projects? Yeah. So again, too, I mean, if you've got um, instances where you have staff that might be doing multiple different activities, and some of them, for example, might be welfare activities, but some of them might be development, you might want to proportionately divide what you're doing there so that you know they spend 20% of their time on welfare and 80% of their time on development. You'd only charge 80% of their, you know, calculate 80% of those costs mm. to include in item 1A. Mm. So if there's no other questions at five, just to let you know that um, the system, the ANCP online system, at line six will automatically tally up. Um, all of the um, dollar oh. figures that you've listed from four and five and give you the total deductions there at line six. It will do the maths for you. So then the system at line seven will automatically tally up, sorry, it'll automatically take your total eligible disbursements and subtract your total deductions and it will spit out for your figure here in the system to give you your total cash RDA. <coughs> so next we then move on to your um, non-cash RDA and this is your gifts in kind and your volunteer services. So first off, your non-cash RDE items must be recorded in your audited financial statements to be eligible for inclusion in your RDE submission. So please, if you if they're not included in your AFS, unfortunately you can't take that into account in the RDE submission. And you may want to look at that for future years to make sure that you're not selling yourself short on your RDE. So the RDE um, explanatory notes give clear definitions for gifts in kind and volunteer services about being eligible. So first off, in relation to gifts in kind, those gifts in kind must be sent overseas and used overseas. So they can't be something that is purely used here in your Australian office. They have to be sent off and be used as part of your development programming. And then again with um, volunteer hours, it's quite um, clearly stated in the RDE explanatory notes that those volunteer hours must be for eligible activities. So your volunteers have to be um, volunteering on um, activities 
that are specifically for your overseas development assistance, emergency relief or rehabilitation activities or development education in Australia. Um, the RDE explanatory notes have hourly rates to value your volunteers at. We understand completely that the volunteer um, or that those hourly, hourly rates or those um, pay brackets there in the RDE explanatory notes may not be what that individual who volunteers with you earns on a day-to-day -day basis in their usual job. But here we're trying to create something that's fair and equal for all organisations to be able to have um, equitable, um, equitable and equal value way of you know, calculating that volunteer contribution to your organisation. So please do use the rates that are in the um, RDE explanatory notes. You'll see it's got there like an annual salary bracket that's listed. So if you're looking to break that down into an annual rate, you can divide that by 52 weeks and then divide it by 37 and a half hours, um, that weekly rate, to give you an hourly rate. I've got a question here that says, can RDE for services provided by an accountant or auditors and printers, et cetera, in Australia be included here? So again, um, we've just come back to that um, eligibility criteria that your um, if it's for gifts in kind so for example if your printer is printing something up here in Australia and that's been sent overseas so those printed goods can be distributed in country then that would be eligible if you were doing printing um, that's to be used here in Australia for um, education yeah, development education, education yeah. then that would be eligible but if it was um, gifts in kind for printing of fundraising materials, for example, then no, that would not be eligible. So for non-cash, yes, for non-cash RDE, then in terms of um, services by an accountant or auditor, if that accountant or auditor is auditing the project in country, yeah. then that would be um, eligible for inclusion if it's directly related to the project. But if it's just volunteer services for you here, the Australian organisation, to do your own books and accounting, mm. then that would not be eligible in this instance. So if it's directly related solely to your development projects overseas, then yes, mm. but otherwise no. I hope that makes sense and I've answered your question, Amy. <laughs> so, um, there's a little bit of um, a little bit now with the Smarty Grants form that um, is, of course, not ideal, but is what we have. So once you've edited, you, once you've entered your the total value of gifts in kind. Okay, sorry, I'm going to jump back because there is another question, and I'll answer this before I talk about um, the before I talk about the tallying. The question is. Is the time provided by international development professionals volunteering as part of governance groups, such as a board or program effectiveness committee, can that be counted um, as an eligible volunteer service for RDE purposes? So typically, when, when we're having a look at the definition in the RDE explanatory notes about volunteer services, um, first, I mean, it's got to be included in the AFS. It's got to be separated out in the AFS. But it's just having a look at the activities that those um, professionals are provide are undertaking as part of those governance groups. So if those governance groups are specifically for overseas development assistance, emergency relief, rehabilitation activities and development education in Australia, then there could be um, potential that some of those could be counted. Um, if they are undertaking some specific activities, for example, you've got a board that is specifically undertaking um, monitoring or evaluation of um, a project, then it could be counted. But generally, the administration of your Australian organisation is not considered eligible for RDE. If you are going to claim anything like that, you're going to have to have strong evidence to provide support for gesture review. So you're going to have to have clear terms of reference that define all of the activities that those groups took 
and you're going to have to be able to show through time sheets or something the amount of exact um, time spent by different professionals to undertake those activities. Is there anything else you'd look for, Jeff, in that instance? Um, no, so normally, uh, we'll just on top of the uh, what you said, Marty, in relation to the question. So I'm assuming that the international development professional are uh, Australian based and not sort of um, mm. uh, internationally based, so that therefore they qualify <laughs> as an Australian volunteer. Mm. Um, and this question is similar that we often get regarding board members as well. Um, and so the same thing uh, actually applies. So yeah, if they're working on specific committees, such as a program uh, effectiveness committee, um, it's different from board responsibilities, normal board responsibilities that would sit under a sort of governance and, and the sort of administration arrangement, then yes, you, um, you could count that time um, as eligible volunteer um, services time. So then you just have appropriate documentation that can be in the form of um, captured uh, times for all those committee meetings um, and sum summarising the hours involved. And ideally, it should, you know, should be signed by the uh, actual volunteer who's provided the services. Um, it can be in the form of seen monthly uh, calendar um, sheets for the days that people have actually sort of been overseas in relation to visits, uh, a lot of the medical uh, incursions are sort of done that way. So there might be eight days uh, incursion in country. And once that's completed, they would sort of sign off that sheet that's transposed into a Excel spreadsheet to support the time and the rate and the calculations. So we'll normally look through those and doing um, you know, doing any spot checks and during accreditation and as part of the um, assessment of the uh, the desk audit you know, at the at the high level I use sort of Excel spreadsheet. Okay, if there's no other questions about um, eligible gifts in kind and volunteer services, just to let you know once you've entered those at line eight and nine on the form, um, then at line ten the ANCP online system will automatically tally up number eight plus number nine to give you number 10. At line 11, you must then enter a number and this is your eligible non-cash RDE number. So if your total non-cash RDE is the same as your cash or less than your cash, then you just re-enter the figure from line 10 at line 11. If your total non-cash RDE is larger than your cash RDE, then at line 11, you must take your total cash RDE figure and re-enter that here at line 11. So your total cash figure being on line 7, you can then re-enter here at line 11. So here we're um, ensuring that your non-cash RDE does not exceed your cash RDE. So if you need to um, limit that amount back to be equal with your cash, then that's what you manually need to do here at line 11. Please do not leave line 11 blank. The instructions here just above should clarify that for you when you're filling the form in the day. Thank you. Well, just a, <laughs> a couple of other points as well in relation to volunteer services, so, and it also relates to the question that we just had previously. Uh, obviously, one of the benefits of referencing back to the audited financial statements uh, is that these figures need to be included in the financial statements. So if they're not in the financial statements in relation to the year just passed, then obviously you can't include them in your RDE. And then part of the benefit of including them in your financial statements is that they would have already gone through a review process by the auditors looking at the documentation that you actually have to support those calculations. Uh, so when you're actually including them in the financial statements, uh, you can actually either include them um, directly in the line items in the financial statements and the notes or only in the notes. Um, so you can, there are many agencies that just include volunteer services and there are obviously a large number of other volunteers that uh, agencies 
NGOs you know, like to recognise that can't be included in uh, in the RDE, such as the marketing and fundraising. Um, and so they often will include the full amount of all the volunteers and then specifically the amount and the basis for that that will be included for the RDE. So that should include the basis of valuation and will usually should reference it back to the um, DFAT rates as the uh, the method of valuation that should be used. Thanks, Mike. You're so if we don't have any questions on there between number eight and eleven, then the last step in the form is just completing line uh, twelve. And here the system will actually automatically do this for you. So it will take your total cash RDE and your total non-cash RDE, it will add it together, and that will give you your total RDE for the year. There's then um, just a box underneath, an additional comments box for you. If you need to clarify or explain anything um, that you have entered in, in your sheet, then here is a spot that you can do it. This isn't the spot where you're going to include all of your calculations and backgrounds. It's just a box that if there's something you need to tell, tell us, tell Jeff, you can pop it here in this box. For example, if the person that has completed this form, the primary contact for RDE, is going to be away on leave during some part of April or something, you might want to pop that in this box here so that um, Jeff knows if he's trying to contact people when they're going to be in and out of the office. So the next parts of the form are very straightforward. This is just where um, you can upload um, for us, or you must upload for us, your um, organisations, audited financial statements and your annual report. Um, organisations, audited financial statements and your annual report. All you need to do in these drop down boxes that you see there, it'll, where it says, for example, annual um, financial statements are provided by, from the drop down box, you can choose whether you would like to upload a document or whether you wanted to put in a URL for where those um, statements are on your website. You just choose URL or upload, and then following on, you type in the URL or you um, upload the document. Then you do the same thing for your annual report. Finally, the last um, section that we um, touched on briefly, this is the um, final question. It says NGOs, it's not the final question, almost final question. Says so NGOs may wish to upload working documents or calculation sheets that would assist um, Jeff as he's reviewing you to understand where there's any differences between your audited financial statements and your RDE submissions. So we'd strongly recommend you put in evidence um, or explanatory material in the form of an Excel spreadsheet that's going to um, help Jeff and clarify things and hopefully avoid too many questions back and forth between, between your organisation and Jeff during April. The next part of the form just asks you to put in the contact details and this is the person that if Jeff has any questions as he goes through your RDE submission or some points of clarification, this is the person he's going to contact. So we understand in many instances this is going to be someone different to the standard ANCP contact that we have. It might be you know, the person in the finance team that's completed it. So please pop all of your contact details there and like I said, if you're not going to be available during April when Jeff is doing his 57 reviews, make a note previously so that he knows um, when you're going to be away. Or provide an alternative contact as well. Yeah, so you could pop that in the um, in the comments box and alter a secondary contact if you had someone else that could be contacted in case you're away. <coughs> Finally, at the um, at the end of the form. We've got the authorised officer detail um, and the chief Ex executive officer declaration that the information that you've provided to us is true and correct. correct. So the authorisation form, when uh, halfway down the page, you'll see the little hyperlink where you can open up that form and get the relevant people within your organisation to sign that and then scan that form and upload it at this point here and pop the name and contact details um, of those, sorry, the name and position details of those officers that have signed off the forms. 
unfortunately, we can't progress with um, reviewing your RDE submission until that uh, authorization form has been uploaded and correctly signed. So now just um, for our last couple of um, minutes, and I'll apologise to many of you that we're just going to maybe go over time by a few minutes just because we started late. But Jeff's just going to quickly talk you through some of the common errors and issues that you can hopefully avoid to make the RDE um, submission process a lot smoother for your organisation. Thanks, Marty. So uh, just quickly, some of the common errors and issues that are uh, consistent that have been consistent over the last couple of years. Um, uh, Mighty flagged at the start, making sure that you put the organisation name um, in both the organisation name and the uh, and the username, so that it correctly identifies um, your RDE worksheet. Ensuring that um, that your RDE figures have been um, identified or tied back to the audited financial statements. So as we flagged, some people um, or some of the um, some of the figures are coming straight from the financial statements, but there are others that will need to have some deduction, deductions and adjustments as well. So um, therefore, uh, most of the NGOs that I've seen or worked with before will normally use an Excel spreadsheet um, outside of the uh, RD form um, as part of their um, putting together the uh, RD submission and then simply include different tabs that sort of go through and reconcile back from the audited financial statements back to the figures that they're submitting in the uh, RD worksheet. So um, it's useful to make sure that you include that as, a, as an attachment because um, it will explain any differences that uh, that I can't see when I can't uh, can't tie a figure back into the uh, back into the financial statements. Another one that comes up occasionally is that the audited financial statements um, are either drafts or they're actually unaudited. So it is important that your that they're finalised audited financial statements, but we do recognise you know, for some organisations that there might be a slight timing difference if you have a uh, December uh, end of financial year, and so it may be um, appropriate that you use almost finalised you know, draft financial statements to actually prepare your RDE, and that may be something you need to flag in the um, in the commentary box at the end, and then just to make sure that you um, submit um, or update the. Uh, Figure um, or update the financial statements and attach them once they're finalised, or uh, email through them to me. There's a quick question that it's uh, is it possible to have the presentation pack emailed to participants? It will be available uh, after the uh, once the uh, the webinar is completed. There's two ways that you can get so first, um, Acton will upload this webinar to YouTube just in case you're having difficulty sleeping one night and you'd like to listen again. Mm -hmm. But also the ANCP team at DFAT, we can email these slides to ANCP contacts number one and number two. So if you're not ANCP contact one or two, just get in touch with the key ANCP people at your in your organisation in the next day or two. Right, uh, one of the other common errors was uh, volunteer services or gifts in kind were not actually uh, recorded or reported in the audit of financial statement. So I touched on that previously. So it is important. If you are looking at including volunteer services and gifts in kind for uh, the first time in your RDE, that you have engaged your auditor early to just flag um, to them that you're actually going to include them and that they will need to sort of touch on those as part of their um, uh, annual audit process and include them in the uh, financial statements. The um, Another common issue is that the financial statements don't actually comply with, comply with the uh, active code of conduct. Um, that is more important um, for this year and, and last year, given that some of the figures are based on the active code of conduct format, i.e. the funds to international or program support costs and community education. So it's important that they do uh, do comply or that there is some reconciliation process, bare minimum as to how 
um, how they do reconcile back to what financial statements we actually have if they're not in the outlook format. Another common uh, error is inclusion of uh, ineligible disbursements. So um, it is important and it's often useful what I see a lot of NGOs do is actually have uh, prior to their RD submission, they have a discussion with uh, financial and program representatives just to make sure that they review those uh, programs that are actually or projects or programs that are actually included in the RG, RDE and make sure that they're all eligible or that there's no ineligible component uh, of the program that, that potentially should be excluded. So it may be necessary to take out some aspects of a program that might be ineligible for uh, any one of the, um, the previous reasons highlighted, such as a religious component you know, or uh, other political advocacy type uh, aspects of expenditure. Uh, just have a quick look at the questions for organisations wanting to become accredited with ANCP. Is there someone who can provide advice and support for the organisation? So in response to that, if you've had a detailed reading of the um, accreditation manual that's available on the DFAT website, you'll see there that there is a provision for technical assistance. So have a read of the eligibility criteria uh, for those who are eligible to receive technical assistance for accreditation. And then you can always contact the accreditation team um, within the ANCP team at DFAT. They, they can be contactable uh, via accreditation at dfat.gov.au and you can discuss that further with them. Um, another common error, <laughs> error and it's, it's just consistent sort of over the years has been the in relation to the inclusion of administration in the eligible expenditure. Um, so if you have when you're deducting your um, DFAT funds, so it's important, so you're obviously deducting the DFAT component, but it is important to reduce that DFAT component by the administration component of uh, the DFAT. So if you're receiving a base allocation of 150,000 um, of, uh, of DFAT funds for your ANCP allocation, and you're spending the full amount of that as administration, 10%, so 15,000, so you would reduce your 150,000 deduction by the 15,000. So only include 135,000 deducted as, um, as DFAT funds. Um, so there's still a number of NGOs. Um, last year, there's a four NGOs who, uh, who made that mistake and um, failed to deduct it in the DFAT funding. Um, there are a number of NGOs who also included um, administration costs in uh, other eligible disbursements, which such as program support, community education. Uh, there are also a number of NGOs who um, use the figure of total disbursements um, in uh, line 1A instead of the funds to international programs. So um, last year was the first year of the change in the new uh, methodology, and so that, that's understandable. Hopefully, everyone will sort of uh, ensure that that it's just funds to international. So um, that's the first sort of starting point. And uh, there were a number of NGOs who um, missed uh, including the the right component at line eleven in relation to the eligible non-cash. So unfortunately, the calculation. Um, can't check that within Smarty Grant, so you do actually have to review that yourself, and, and obviously I'll be checking that as part of the uh, part of the review process. And another challenge, uh, more of an issue from my perspective, was that the person that actually sort of put together and was the prime owner of the RDE worksheet uh, wasn't available uh, in early April or in April. So um, it is important if you are going away to to flag that so I can make sure I can get to your worksheet early or, or later uh, as the case, uh, case may be. I've got another question here about should DAP grants be included under 4A in deductions? 
Yes, they should be because DAP grants is DFAT funding. The DAP program is a DFAT program. It's ODA program. So that unfortunately is DFAT funding that you'll need to deduct at 4A. So the next thing we wanted to talk about very quickly was the RDE spot checks. So this year in 2018, we will select up to seven NGOs for an RDE spot check. We will typically undertake spot checks in um, before the end of June. So they'll definitely done, be done before the end of the financial year. And NGOs will be advised by DFAT that, they, that they've been selected for an RDE spot check and will then um, hand you over directly to Jeff and Jeff will liaise with you in terms of timing and so forth for, um, for the spot check to occur. Um, if, if DFAT does select your organisation um, for a spot check, please assist PK by you know, cooperating and making the right staff available before the end of June. We know that it's a busy time for many of you in the lead up to the ad plan period and the end of the financial year, but there will be lots of advance notice and it's it's just the one day and hopefully if all of your records are in order, it should be a relatively straightforward activity for your organisation. Um, in the ANCP manual this year, you'll find that we will include, in the new revision of the manual for 2018, we will include additional details and uh, standard terms of reference for an RDE spot check. <coughs> we have a question just from a um, newly accredited NGO in 2017-18 about do we need to do three RDE submissions for the three previous financial years? The answer is no, you don't, because we have your RDE submissions from the accreditation process. So we will be able to take um, all of those, this current year's one that you're giving us, and then the other two most recent years from your uh, accreditation report to using the calculations. So that, that is fine and hopefully saves you a bit of work. So I might get Jeff um, just quickly to talk you through how an RDE spot check works on the ground once DFAT selected, um, selected you for a, a, a spot check and advised you that one is happening. Jeff then sort of leads the rest of the process. Thanks, Marty. So we have developed a, um, an RDE uh, spot check, our terms of reference. So um, that will be something that will be sent out to you in the initial communication um, from uh, from DFAT. And then the next step is that um, there will the, uh, there'll be a nominated representative in respect to that um, when you advise DFAT. And I will sort of commence that communication, um, brief the um, representative and uh, organise a time to actually sort of come out to uh, to do the visit. Um, so we will be looking to do those uh, visits reasonably quickly after the um, NGOs have been identified for a spot check and that will happen sort of sometime in May and uh, June, at least before the end of the financial year. Um, so I'll be looking to uh, get the RD worksheets, uh, supporting audited financial statements and, and schedules and sort of Agree those and looking at um, looking back to some more detailed supporting of those figures. So be looking at uh, closer examination of the uh, general ledger to uh, to support those. We'll be looking at sort of uh, any allocation uh, methodology in respect of uh, overhead um, and the uh, allocation of costs to uh, specific departments. We'll be looking at that reconciliation of the figures from your RDE um, supporting schedule back to the audited financial statements and sort of any adjustments in, in respect to that. And uh, also looking at more detail around the supporting documentation in respect to your um, volunteer services and, uh, and gifts in kind. Um, on the completion of the, uh, the work that's done on site, um, we'll then do a, um, a brief exit interview with the, uh, the relevant sort of authorised representative and then there'll be a draft report that comes back to, um, to yourself 
and then sort of goes on to uh, to DFAT as a uh, as a final report. So it'll be a relatively painless process, I uh, I'll guarantee, and uh, I think uh, it will be sort of something that DFAT are looking at at, um, at doing sort of a bit more of sort of going forward as well. So uh, we'll make it as uh, pain free as possible. <laughs> I'm sure seven of you will enjoy Jeff's company for a day. <laughs> so some common issues that tend to be picked up in spot checks, Jeff? Yeah, and so look, we've we touched on a couple of these and they're similar to some of the things that we find on in the initial sort of RD review. Um, and that's really around that sort of allocation of administration costs. So um, there are some NGOs that don't allocate any administration and there are others um, who allocate a large portion of administration costs across, across uh, different uh, different areas. So we'll be looking at that methodology and the process and how how that's actually uh, calculated and we'll view that for appropriateness and, and reasonableness. The other uh, issue is around the community education costs. So obviously those figures are in the audited financial statements um, and the auditors will have done a little bit of work on those. So from an audit perspective, at the end of the day, they probably not too fussed whether it's marketing or community education. It's all a, a little bit the same to them. But it's a bit more important from us to ensure that you know, it's appropriate um, expenditure from a RD perspective. And so therefore, I'll be looking around the methodology as to how you allocate those costs for community education. And so recognize as well, often uh, in these RD spot checks, we do identify areas where you may be underclaiming um, your RD, and you could uh, use some um, some appropriate sort of uh, methodologies to actually increase your RD, and and that's often the case with mm. community education around um, the staff, the marketing staff, um, you know what specific roles that they're actually doing, whether some of that can be eligible for community education, and it's all about coming up with a, a reasonable. So conservative, you know, not too aggressive approach around how you split and allocate actual costs such as printing of uh, annual reports and marketing materials that may include an element of fundraising you know, and personal and, uh, and other sort of support costs as well. Um, and the other issue is just you know, making sure that uh, the right people are available um, for the uh, for the RD spot check. So obviously that'll be something that we'll agree at the time of, uh, of teeing up. The, um, the spot check, but it is important when you're preparing your RD returns to to recognise that these are looked at, you know, currently looked at as part of the accreditation process and also as part of the RD spot check. So it's worthwhile to do those reconciliations and write yourself supporting notes so that when it comes time to explain why you've got this deduction figure um, you know, that you sort of put in but forgot to uh, write a description why that you can actually sort of um, remember because uh, for those NGOs that have a uh, end of financial year at 30 June and preparing their RDE return now, that's a, uh, a long time difference between the last of the financials. So it's good to write some of those notes yeah, early. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. So that brings us to the end of the formal part of our presentation. I'm really conscious that we've gone over time and thank you so much to all of you for staying online for the additional time. If you have any other questions, now's the time to, um, to get them in the system. But yes, this, uh, we've got a question, is this presentation um, going to be recorded and made available? So yes, Axford will have rec our recording. The presentation and they will publish that to YouTube so that you can listen to it over and over again. Um, and uh, as Ackford are just advising here, within seven to ten working days they'll um, publish that um, to the YouTube, uh, YouTube and you can find it via the usual methods. So please do stay online at the end of the webinar and there's a short um, survey just for you to give us some feedback about this about the webinar and whether or not it meets your needs or not. Um, but finally, in um, wrapping up, of course, if you need any advice or assistance, please don't hesitate to contact the ANCP team via the usual methods. So our phone number in Canberra during business hours is 02 61785 or you can um, email us at ancp at dfat.gov.au. 
via the ANC email box, we can always direct you to the Smarty Grants team, or if it's a very technical question, we'll seek advice from Jeff on things, but we can uh, figure that out from the ANCP mailbox. Please, if you have any questions, we will email out the presentation slides. Um, you can find the RDE explanatory notes plus the ANCP manual on the DFAT website. Um, just look for them in the search bar. Thank you so much for staying online. Thank you again to ACFID for hosting us today. Um, we really appreciate it and we look forward to seeing you all in person soon. Thank you.